Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, we're back for the next series of this study for Protestant Catechism. That's what PC means, Protestant Catechism. Today, it's Sunday or Lord's Day. Okay. Now, the thing I'm noticing after we got to the first part is, is I used to teach Sunday school for grade school kids. And looking back, I was a false convert. A lot of our teachings, we tell the children, God says this, or this is how God wants it, but we hardly ever reference scripture. And that's what you're going to find out as we get through this. So, let's get started. It's going to be a little bit longer than, than the last one. So, first question, what day of the week does the Christian church keep holy? Now, if you watch the last study we did on this, what was the first question they asked? They were supposed to be talking about the Jewish Sabbath. First question they ask is, what portion of our time does God command us to keep holy? And they say one day a week. Then when they get them through the Sabbath, now we're going to get to the Lord's Day. Okay, Sunday or the Lord's Day. Uh, so they ask, what day of the week does Christians keep Christian church keep holy? Answer, the first day of the week called Sunday. How do they get this? Well, if you turn to Acts 20, verse 4. And there accompanied him unto Asia, Sopater, I'm bad with names, of Berea and of the Thessali Thessalonians, Ar Aristarchus, and Secundus, Secundus, and Gaius, or Gaius, of Derby and Tim Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychus, and Trophimus. Verse 5, these going before tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days. Okay. So it took five days to get there. Where we abode seven days. Remember that, seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. In other words, it's the last day that he was there. And continued his speech until midnight, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. Okay. Now, this is the first time you see them meeting on the first day of the week, but here's the thing. They were there for seven days. So what did Paul do for seven days? Hey, let's go fishing for six days, and we have to wait till the first day of the week before Paul can say anything or preach anything. When you're reading that, the part you got to get to is where he says he's going to leave on the morrow. Okay. See, and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. That was what's so important about that. That was his last day there, and he was going to leave the next day. Was he just sitting around for six days? He, they were there for seven days. No, he'd be doing the work of the Lord. Does this right here, though, this whole passage justify, well, now we've got to keep the first day of the week holy every week. No. Now, they didn't use any scripture to justify this. But I'm going through scripture because that's what a Bible believer does. <clears throat> if you turn to 1 Corinthians 16.1, here's another mention of the first day of the week. First Corinthians 16.1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so ye, do ye. So he's given this order to someone, two people. Excuse me. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. Okay. In other words, take all the donations in. And he doesn't, when he gets there, he doesn't want them saying, well, we don't have them yet, so now we're going to collect them. He wants everything ready for them. Verse 3, and when I come, who, whomsoever ye have, shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liber, liberality unto Jerusalem. Okay. I had to look up the word liberality. It means a particular act of generosity, a donation, a gratuity. Okay. 
So that's what's going on there. But it says in verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him. So he's saying on the first day of the week, I'm going to come and get this stuff and then take it where it needs to go. Where is it talking about fellowship and them coming together? As far as, you know, like these Babel buildings, we got to come together on the, the first day of the week, it's Sunday. Okay? It doesn't, but it's the only two places I found that talked about them the first day of the week. Okay? But that one instance where Paul did preach on the first day of the week, that's still not justification to say now we have to keep every first day of the week, every Sunday, holy. And that's the only day we're supposed to do it. Because okay? what day of the week do Christians keep, church keep holy? The first day of the week called Sunday. And if you watched the last study, we went through the verses to talk about how we're supposed to be holy every day. Okay, we're supposed to keep every day holy. Okay? We're supposed to be pleasing God every day. Next one. What authority have we for the change of this day from the seventh to the first? It's talking about the Sabbath, now to the first. So what authority do we have this? The authority of the practice, this is their answer, the authority of the practice of the holy apostles and the churches in all ages. Okay. What's going on here? Um, spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world uh, and not after Christ, <laughs> paraphrasing. It's, what they're saying here, it's based off traditions. First it says practice of the holy apostles, chapter and verse. I just showed you the only two verses that talk about the first day of the week when it comes to the apostles. If you go to the beginning of Acts, it talks about how Peter, they were still going to the synagogues on the Sabbath day, not the first day of the week. Then you get to Paul going out to the Gentiles. He meets with them for seven days. And on the last day that happened to be the first day of the week, he was teaching them before he left on the morrow, the next day. So... Um, 1 Timothy 4, 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Okay, the Bible does say that Paul said, uh, be as, I'm trying to get the words because I'm not, I didn't put it in here, but, oh yeah, I did put it in here. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be ye followers of me, even I also am of Christ. So yeah, Christians can set the example, but that example, as I am of Christ, that Paul's talking about, our example is this book right here. So anything we do on matters of faith and practice, the practice part, everything we do, needs to line up with Scripture. Okay. When we're saying it's a thing we're doing for the Lord, it better be something we can give God thanks in, uh, glory in, uh, we can do it in the name of Jesus Christ, but it still needs to be based off Scripture. Okay. So, like I said, it's based off traditions of men, and they just basically admitted it, but they threw in the holy apostles, yet they couldn't back it by Scripture. The next question, why was Sunday made the great day for Christian rest and worship? Okay. Answer, because the resurrection of the Christ took place on the first day of the week. Now let that sink in for a little bit. The answer, that statement with the answer, that statement's true. If you turn to Mark 16.9, shoot over to Mark 16.9. Sixteen verse nine. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So the Bible does teach Jesus rose the first day of the week. But how is that justification for just taking that and, and saying now we've got to meet every Sunday, first day of the week? The church has to come together. Okay, there's no justification for it. Right. So once again, they're grasping at straws, and they're mis actually here they're misusing scripture. Yes, it's truth, as far as Jesus was raised on the first day of the week, but they mix it with lies. Well, so and that means we have to keep the first day of the week and come together. That doesn't mean that. All right. 
Question, next one. Would the apostles have changed the day if Christ had not instructed them to do so? Okay. This question you've got to remember when we get down to another question. First, they're trying to make it out. It's a command from God. Because here it is. A, no, they acted under his inspiration and by his authority. Jesus Christ. Where did Jesus Christ say we have to meet the first day of the week every week? The body of Christ, the church? It's not in there. Mm -hmm. So they're saying the apostles wouldn't have changed it because Christ instructed them to. Mm -hmm. I had to write down chapter and verse on this one because I couldn't find it. Uh, people always like to run to Hebrews where it says not forsaking the uh, gathering of ourselves together. And they try to apply that to today when that's for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. And we always say we're not against fellowship. Instruction righteousness, it's there. We should do our best when it's ever possible to fellowship among the brethren, to encourage each other, to strengthen each other through the word. Hold each other accountable. But you don't compromise. There's not a command for us to be doing it every week. The next question. When did Jesus instruct his disciples? Okay. Here's their answer. In the three years of his ministry, and also during the 40 days between his resurrection and ascension, when he gave commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen and spake of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now stop and let that sink in. In the three years of his ministry, is about the Sabbath day. He would go into the Sabbath day, the last study we did, the, the first section of the study. Um, it was a custom for Jesus to go into the synagogues and, and read. But it was a custom. Okay. He also went out and preached on the Sabbath day. He was healing out and about healing on the Sabbath day. Um, but he was also in the synagogues healing on the Sabbath day. But the point is, is that through your ministry... Uh, where does it say anything about him commanding the church that the first day of the week they're to come together every week? Okay. And also during the 40, 40 days between his resurrection and ascension. Okay. Uh, I had to read here Acts 1 1. If you go to Acts 1 1, because I was like, 40 days, I remember this. But let's go look it up. See, there's a lot of truth in the answer, but does the answer line up with the question? All right. We're going to read through four. The former treat, I don't want to say treaties, but uh, treatise, I can't pronounce that one, so sorry about that. Have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and, and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, that's where we get the forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So what did he preach in that forty days? He speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. Okay. Where does it say specifically he's telling them and commanding them first day of the week? You need to make sure that body of Christ is there. And as we get down, the very last question of the study says, what was the only justification for not showing up, basically? Okay. They better be there unless they're sick or dying or dead. <laughs> you know, that Jesus isn't saying that in there at all. Okay. Um, and my question there is, what about Paul? Okay. Because they said the commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen and spake of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Paul wasn't there for the three years that Jesus was there. I mean, he wasn't part of the, the 12 disciples at that time. And the 40 days here where he's teaching them, Paul wasn't a part of that. Paul's later on. Okay? God did choose him as the 12th apostle, but he wasn't there during this time that they're saying that's when the command came. Okay. 
So a part of me was like, well, what about Paul? Uh, Acts 9.1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute Cutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is the first command God gave Paul. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I want to read this because I'm like, What about Paul? This is the first command gave, God gave Paul. Okay. And as you read through, Paul met on the first day of the week. We already read that uh, for a certain situation. He was only going to be there seven days. They started talking about his last day there, which happened to be on the first day of the week. Okay, before he moved on with his ministry, because he's going around from people to people, uh, church to church in different areas. So... Yeah, it's like, what about Paul? And then I got to thinking, well, when was the first time, what was the first command God gave Paul? You know, that was the first command God gave Paul. But nowhere, like I said, that first command, you keep going through all the commands. Where is God commanding Paul to pass on to us that we have to meet the first day of the week, every week? We have to come together. The next question, did Christ claim to control the Sabbath? Now we're going to go back to the Sabbath. The answer is, yes, he declared, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Okay. One thing I had to point out is a Lord, and we're going to get this into our get into this in our other studies about who is Jesus to you mainly. It's not about who Jesus is as far as the facts, the absolute truth. It's about our attitude towards Jesus in these studies and saying, does your life reflect that you treat Jesus this way? You know, King, Lord. Counselor, Savior, Almighty God. Okay. So a Lord, when I was doing these studies, looking into it, a Lord rules, judges, and reigns in his house. You have a king that does it over a nation, but a Lord does it over his house. Okay. Matthew 12, 8, we're just going to go through all three of these, say the same thing. So where do they get that answer? Matthew 12, 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Mark 2, 28. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Luke 6, 5, And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Okay, he's the high priest. We already talked about that in the previous study in those instances where they were accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. Okay. So that question, did Christ claim to control the Sabbath? He, was, he didn't claim to control the Sabbath. He claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath. He rules the Sabbath. He judges the Sabbath. And he reigns on the Sabbath. Okay. That's what a Lord does. Uh, question. Next one. Have Christians always kept the first day since our Savior's time? Here's their answer. Yes, they have in all ages of the church, and this universal observance of the first day proves that it must have been so ordered by Christ and his apostles. Because the church traditions of men, they've always done it. And not and that's a lie. The church, the Catholic Church always has, but actual Bible believing Christians, I'll get into this in a second, but they're saying it must have been an, um, an order from Christ. Yet the questions before made it out to be, this was commanded by Christ. Like it's absolute truth. Then we get to this question, it must have so ordered by Christ. Because why? Because that's what everybody else is doing. Do we see that today in these Babel buildings? Well, everybody else is doing it. It must be okay. It must be in the Word of God. <laughs> I was like, wow. So... No, they acted under his, um, down here. No, they acted under his inspiration and by his authority. First, 
he did, then he must have. You see the traditions of men dictating the word of God. I'm sorry, we already talked about that. Where they said, first it's a command of God in the previous question. But here, no, it must be. It, it must be, I mean, because everybody else is doing it. Well, Colossians 2.8. Uh, we all know this one. If you want to turn there. Uh, Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay, you'll see this so much, brothers and sisters in Christ, that these people in organized religion and these Babel buildings, they'll always try to quote the church fathers, or they'll always go, this is how we've always done it. Okay, that doesn't justify doing it. Does it line up with scripture? It doesn't. Okay, Second Peter 2.2. 2. So what's going on here with them trying to use this? Okay, Second Peter 2.2. 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. I had to put that down there, because when we tell them, hey, chapter and verse, the Bible says that we're supposed to keep every day holy. Okay. Our body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. When you have the Holy Ghost in you, because we talked about this in the previous study, on how the lost world is unholy, we're supposed to be holy as, Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. We're supposed to be holy every day. We show them this stuff. They hate it. They despise the truth. Uh, where are we supposed to build a building, call it a church, and invite both saved and lost to it? We're commanded not to fellowship with the lost world. They hate the truth. They'll start to hate you. They'll tell you that uh, you need to go away. Okay. Where at is any of this? Okay. Bottom line, this is just so obvious. They're basing it off man's authority, not God's authority. So the next question we get to, what happens on the what happened on the first Lord's Day? This is where I might need some help from the brethren. I've tried doing a little bit of study on it. So their answer is, Jesus Christ arose from the dead and on the evening of the same day appeared to his disciples and gave them their commission. John 20, 21, and 22. Okay. Um, once again, it's a half-truth. Jesus did arise on the first day. Okay? But does the answer line up with the question? Lord's Day. Okay? Acts 2.20 I'm just going to read it right here. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon in, into blood before the great no, notable day of the Lord come. Okay, the reason I quoted that is I read in here, I said, okay, we've got day of the Lord, a reference to a thousand year uh, reign of Jesus Christ. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. But I, I was like, for the first, I was like, there isn't any day of the Lord in the Bible. So I went to 1 Corinthians 1 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ? There's another time it talks about the day of the Lord. I just grabbed a few. Okay. First Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So I kept finding day of the Lord, day of the Lord, but the Lord's day? Okay. I couldn't find it. Okay. Because I put on here, I said, can anyone show me in the King James Bible where the first day of the week is called the Lord's day? I can't find that. I did find the Lord's Day. We'll get to it because they'll talk about it in another question as we get down. Okay? Uh, there's a reference in Revelation 1.9 to the Lord's Day. Okay? So I found a reference to it, but I couldn't find out exactly what it meant. When we get to it, we'll talk about it as far as what day that means. Exactly. I have some ideas, but I'm talking about it's the only time it's mentioned. So how do they relate the Lord's Day to the first day of the week when Jesus Christ is raised from the dead is the biggest question. So we'll get to that. The next question on here. What happened on the next Sunday? A. Answer. Jesus appeared to the disciples again when he gave St. Thomas the proof he required to confirm his faith. John 20, 27. Okay. Turn to John 20, 19. After his the the week after his resurrection is this truth. 
We're going to find out. John 20, 19. And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So it's truth. It was the first day of the week. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Okay. It's the first day of the week. That's truth. So that's the question. What happened on the next Sunday? That's what happened on the next Sunday. But the question I have to ask is, is this the way of trying to push justifying we have to meet every first day of the week? Okay. Because I had to tell myself when I was doing this, I said, this is truth. But remember, this lesson is to teach why we have to meet on the first day of the week. So it's putting things in people in the kid's head that, well, here's the first day of the week. Here's the first day. Here's the first of the day of the week. And then they're taking it and trying to automatically say it's about the Lord's Day, Sunday. The church has to meet every Sunday. Okay. Next question. What happened on another Sunday, Acts 2-4? Answer, on the day of Pentecost, which was the first day of the week, the Holy Ghost descended upon the disciples. Okay. The Holy Ghost descended on the disciples. Okay. Now, Acts 2.1, you go to Acts 2.1. Now, I can't say it's not the first day of the week. Okay. But I went and looked at the, the day of Pentecost. Okay. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and it says... And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I read through there and I'm like, I don't see it saying it's the first day of the week. It just says the day of Pentecost. Okay. Now, it might have mentioned it somewhere and I missed it, but I'm just, I tried looking this stuff up. Uh, Acts 20.16 Maybe later on it lets us know. So... Acts 20.16 For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. That's just, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I just I don't see where it specifically says that the day of Pentecost is on the first day of the week. So when they ask this question, it says Acts 2.4 it mentions it. I'm going to go back there for a second. It mentions it. And they were filled, because it said 2-4, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But where does it say first day of the week? They're adding to Scripture. Okay. What happened on another Sunday? They're adding to Scripture. Okay. That's what I'm finding out in here. They make claims and they can't back it by scripture. And sometimes they'll use scripture because the answer lines up with scripture, but the answer doesn't line up with the question. Okay. It's like me saying, why am I always right? And then the answer is, well, because I know how to fix cars. Does that, do I know how to fix cars? Yeah, but does that mean I'm always right? You know what I'm saying? They don't line up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16.8 also says, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. But like I said, I couldn't find in that whole section where it says the first day of the week is Pentecost. So, next question. Quote a text to show that the disciples continued to meet on the Lord's Day for worship. And they did give a reference of Acts 27. A, and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul pe preached unto them. Right? We talked about this one, Acts 27. Uh, this is in the Bible. And upon the first day, King James Bible. And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to part on the morrow, continued his speech until mid midnight. Okay? We talked about that, ready to part on the morrow. So they went over this again. Next question, what is here, but remember they said 
continue to meet on the Lord's Day, that last question. But once again, where does it say Lord's Day? Is the first day of the week. Question, what is here meant by breaking bread? Here we go, <laughs> brothers and sisters in Christ. All right. A, celebrating the Holy Communion of the Lord's Supper. See, yes, we have communion. What's communion, brother and sister Christ? It has to do with reflecting on your life with the Lord. Okay, the body and the blood. He died to pay for our sins. It's a reflection for us to judge ourselves and see how our walk with the Lord is. Okay? Is there more sanctification that needs to go in our life if we're doing enough wor works that we're capable of doing for the Lord? Good works. Okay? Acts 2.41 Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Okay. So let's go down to 7. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man hath needed. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, daily, not on the first day of the week. And what were they doing? And breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. See, right there, just destroyed it. Well, the breaking bread up here is they were doing communion, right? No. They were going from house to house, daily, preaching the word. They were breaking bread, which means they ate together. They spent time together. Okay? But they grabbed from that and saying, oh, see, that's, that's holy communion. And what's the, what's the number one organized religion that we know of, brothers and sisters in Christ, that promote communion that you're supposed to do every Sunday uh, to the most part there's once a week you got to do holy well, they they call it the Eucharist right? pretty much giving away who I was talking about they call it the Eucharist uh -huh. so question here here we get from it what is what is Sunday called by Saint John and Revelation 110 there's a lot of saints you know, and I don't, like I said, in the Bible, if you get the old Bibles, the first epistle, general of John, I have another Bible where sometimes it'll say Saint John, and then you read the book of John. But they say that a lot about it, Saint this, Saint that. Um, in Revelation 1.10, here's the only place in the Bible that it says Lord's Day. The answer, he called it the Lord's Day on the occasion of his wonderful vision in the island of Patmos. Okay, that's true. Okay, but right there, the question was weird how they worded it. What is Sunday? Not why is Sunday called? What or what is Sunday called? And now they're trying to say every day is the Lord's day. But if you turn to Revelation chapter one verse seven. See, I wanted to start in verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. See, this is before he talks about the Lord's day. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit, capital S spirit, on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, 
unto Pergamus, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto I almost want to say Philadelphia. Uh, I'm probably doing that so wrong. And unto La Laodicea. I did pretty good except for that last that one there. But the point is, this is the only time I found where it says the Lord's Day. But quite right before it, it talks about, Behold, he cometh with, with clouds. Part of me thinks because John is going to get caught up that he calls it the Lord's Day because we don't know when that's going to happen for us. The catching away of the body of Christ, the resurrection. Okay? The resurrection for those who are already dead in Christ and the catching away for those of us who are alive. The dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which remain. Okay? But um, I was sitting there, I was like, it says it's the Lord's Day, but by definition, what day is that? How can they take that and say the Lord's Day is a Sunday? Okay, I couldn't figure that out. Uh, Acts 1.1, 1, 1. I'm just going to go over some of these. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus both began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. I just started reading stuff about clouds. He was taken up in a cloud. Okay? And we're told that uh, Acts 1, 9, down to 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast, Towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, when Jesus comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, right, wipes out that million man army, 200. Uh... The other thing was, is uh, John 21, 20. I was reading that. Then Peter, turning about, seeth disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that unto thee? It wasn't saying, this passage is not saying, I don't believe, once we get to Revelation we find this out, that John was going to live forever until Jesus comes back. I believe this is talking about that John would die until, some people say he was, he was caught up, but regardless, until he saw all those things, because he's writing to us in the book of Revelation. Okay. Could that what he mean by the Lord's day? This is what the Lord said, this day is when it's coming true. He's showing me all this stuff, like what's going on here in John 21.1, that he tarry till I come. What is that to you? Could that be what the Lord's day, what he's mean by the Lord's day? The day that the Lord told, said that, he lived to the sea. Okay. Next question that they ask. But yeah, if you've got some ideas on this, please, I'd like to know. I don't know everything. And there's some times where God just hasn't revealed it to me. He might have revealed it to a brother or sister in Christ. Okay. Question. Why was it called the Lord's Day by the first Christians, plural? Let's get the answer real quick. Because it was the day on which our Lord arose and triumphed from the grave. There I go again asking, how do they get this? The only place the Lord's Day is mentioned is in Revelation, and it's used by one apostle, John. Not Christians, plural. Okay. The first Christian um, would be the twelve disciples, which would be John, but Paul's the disciple to the Gentiles. Okay? They kept talking the transition. See, it was the Sabbath for the Jews, and now for the Gentiles, it's the, um, it's the first day of the week. It's Sunday. 
Well, Paul would have mentioned it then. Okay. Paul never mentioned that we're supposed that the first day of the week is the Lord's day. And once again, how does one make a connection in Scripture? Sounds like justification for the Eucharist every Sunday, the Lord's Day. And that's exactly what it sounds like to me. Okay. So we're going to get to the last question. How did the early Christians keep Sunday? This is one I was talking about, the very last question. A, they celebrated the Lord's Supper every Sunday, the Eucharist. This is supposed to be Protestant, brothers and sisters of Christ. This is a Protestant catechism for Christians that are separated. The Protestant Reformation, we're getting away from the Catholic Church, and we're going to try to be Bible-believing Christians. I don't see a difference between the two most of the time. Okay? They celebrated the Lord's Supper every Sunday and were constant attendants on divine worship from which nothing but sickness or banishment could detain them. If you were banished, in other words, you weren't allowed, then, you know, that's why you're not there. Or you're sick. But if you weren't those two, you better be in there. Okay? And that's how the Christians of the past, that's how they were. And I had to say chapter and verse. I couldn't find a chapter and verse on that one whatsoever. Okay? Now, how are we supposed to fellowship? The Bible does, I didn't put a lot of that in here, but the Bible does line up with fellowship. We pray together. Okay? We study the Word of God together. Uh, we hold each other accountable. Okay? Doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You hold each other accountable uh, to the do's and don'ts, and you teach the do and do do's and don'ts. We correct one another when we fall into temptation and sin. We protect one another when we're reproving uh, the lost world, wolves in sheep's clothing, you know, fake Christians, and we teach doctrine to one another, and we talk about doctrine. Okay, that's true fellowship. Mm -hmm. But you can do that any day of the week. But the other thing I threw in here is what about the Waldensians? Okay, uh, try looking up the Waldensian, Waldensians, if I can say it right, sometime. Okay, and what about the Christians uh, throughout the centuries that were being persecuted by the Catholic Church? Okay. If they met on every Sunday, wouldn't it be easier to round up? Okay, it's Sunday, guys. We're going to go out and hunt down those Christians. They just keep meeting every Sunday. Uh, no, it was random. Okay. Different places. wasn't out in the open. Sometimes it was out in the open as far as out in the forest area. But, um, yeah, it's just, this is so, so far, if you haven't realized, I believe this is Catholic. Anytime you see catechism, I just think Catholic. Okay, they can say it's Protestant all at once, but there's so much in here that I've learned why Catholics do certain things, and the whole push of uh, a brother in Christ at King James Video Ministries talked about how the Protestant Reformation was to reform the Catholic Church. It wasn't to get away from it. Okay, it wasn't that okay we we want the Word of God in our hands, which they did, but now that we have the Word of God in our hands, we know what truth is, and we want nothing to do with the Catholic Church. That wasn't their attitude. We just want to reform the Catholic Church. They brought in a lot of the pagan practices and everything of the Catholic Church. And what happens? It tainted everything. When you let Satanism in and paganism and you start going against the Word of God and making traditions of men uh, the standard, uh, it ruins everything. Okay, A little leaven left the whole lump. So this is this section. Hopefully you've stuck with me. The whole point of this is I just wanted to go through this book with you so we can learn some things. Okay? I didn't know about the Lord's Day that that's even in the Bible uh, as far as the phrase Lord's Day. Um, and it's right there in front of me. Some of you might have already knew it, some not. The 40 days. Sometimes we forget numbers, you know, Jesus being uh, there for 40 days. Uh, when I grew up as a false Christian, I always thought that he was raised from the dead he showed himself over several days, not a week later, several days, and then he went back to heaven. But that's not what really happened. Okay. But then again, I wasn't being taught from Scripture, just word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and end that here. So thank you for watching. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. See you in the next video.